got the recording for Bob's presentation. Oh my goodness, recording about okay, there you go. Well, let me <clears throat> excuse me, let me uh, get the share screen thing going. And uh, I'm gonna do the best I can with what I got. We're gonna do that one. And uh, so can you all see the uh, <clears throat> K4DU station move? Uh, yes. We're good. Okay. Uh, this is going to be uh, a little bit expanded beyond um, what uh, I think the, uh, the, the promotion was. Uh, because in essence, what I want to talk about is this whole process of moving my station uh, from one location where it had been for 35 years <clears throat> to finding a new location and, uh, and then starting to rebuild. Uh, in, in one sense, it's a, it's a kind of a neat opportunity. It's a chance to, to start with a, a clean sheet and, and uh, do some things that you might find more difficult to do otherwise or not get around to. It's like forcing you to, to, to redo everything. So that's uh, <clears throat> where we are. So new home, had to figure out where, build or buy. Uh, I know I, we, we decided together that we wanted at least two acres, uh, a place where there was no antenna restrictions, convenient to Charlottesville, uh, convenient to Oakhurst out at Kent store, which is part of Ann's uh, family. Uh, they have uh, their parents live there for many years and it's still in the family and they get together quite often there. So we went out, we looked at Nalmar County, Green County, Madison, Orange, Nelson, Louisa, Savannah. <clears throat> I had somebody that I had worked with years ago. Um, and actually at that time, he, he was a, a member of the customer support group at MJ Systems. <clears throat> He's now a, a successful realtor in the Charlottesville area. And he did quite a good job for us. Um, and uh, we looked at land for sale. We looked at existing homes. And finally, we found a place that, uh, that seemed to meet our needs. Um, and so now with every change, it's a new opportunity. You have to understand the new location, figuring out what could be done with the antennas. And it, as, as always, it's really a work in progress. So I, we had no HOA, no, no covenants restrictions. Uh, the, the property is a slightly lower elevation. Uh, there are uh, woods, basically, I think about a third of the land here, maybe a quarter of the land is actually in woods. Uh, and there's lots of yard and it uh, slopes from the front to the back. The front of the house faces north. And I've got a tree line that starts really at, uh, at the northwest uh, corner and runs down to the southeast. And at the southeast, it's really within um about 25 feet of my um, uh, border there my uh, my eastern border so let's see if i can uh, show this to you so this is looking straight from the front of the property toward, toward the rear uh, can you see my cursor yep uh, yes okay. okay so this if you look down this line of trees uh this is the eastern side. I'm looking directly south. That these are the trees that run from northwest to southeast. And um, so there, there's opportunities here. And there's also, it's fairly deep. The property is 400 feet deep. Is that right? Uh, on a feeder yard. And, um, and 200 feet wide. Yeah, two acres. Um, now at the old QTH, I had a 58 foot guide Roan 25G tower. that was 130 feet from the house. There was a Carolina Wyndham that ran from a very large pine that was in front of the house all the way back to the tower. And I had a 60 meter NVIS antenna that was about 18 feet off the ground uh, in the woods. And I had a Comet GP3 antenna uh, for 440 and, and uh, two meters and a uh, four element uh, 220 beam on the back deck. 
So the big challenge was going to be removing the beam and tower from the old QTH. So the original plan was sell the tower, sell the beam, start scratch, start from scratch with everything. Um, but after thinking about this and trying to sell the tower, we discovered essentially that selling a tower during COVID times is, is, is difficult. Uh, people know that it's gonna take some work to take the antenna down, uh, to get the rotator, et cetera, and then take the tower down. It's an investment of time and in some cases money. Um, and the other thing that made it really difficult for me to do that first approach was that I really, really like the summer's beam that I have been using uh, on the top of that tower since uh, the year 2000. The, uh, the tower that I had back there, and we'll get to that. And, and I gotta tell you that I've, I've gotten a lot of help and continue to get help from my friends. So here is the summer's beam. The boom is 20 feet long. The longest element's about 33 feet. And this thing weighs 92 pounds. Um, and if you notice here, there's a rope uh, about four feet above. This basically holds the boom fairly level because if, otherwise, if you didn't, it would, it would begin to sag. And you'll see some of the detail of this. And by the way, this is Benny up, in, up on the tower, uh, WB4SQC. He's from Tennessee and he, and in, in the, um, about 2017, he uh, helped us do some maintenance on, on that. And he does good work. So when you get the, the beam on the ground, this picture was taken in 2017. This is the boom. And let me go back to this other picture up here. All of these are driven elements out here. And then what you have, it's like a monobander for 10, 15, and 20. And then the, there's a log periodic network that connects these shorter elements that are sort of in between. And that's what yeah, it works on 17 and 12. Um, so to remove the beam and tower, we got the, uh, the AARC antenna team and, and others uh, for the ground crew. Tim Jellison, the professional tower climber, came from Elkins, West Virginia. And we got buy-in from the XYL who well, actually really was excited about this project. So this is the very beginning of the process of taking the, the, the tower down. Uh, we've got uh, Tim up here on the tower and what he's doing essentially is getting the gen pole up and then taking that rope that's uh, up at the very top down. And it talks about safety and you'll see that everybody's away from the tower except for the guy that's up on the tower. And he's, uh, he's secured with the, uh, uh, with his harness, and there are a number. There are a few people around here that that uh, wore hard hats because we were going to be down underneath later on. And so, my 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 new motto for life is "Happy wife, happy life." Uh, she was excited about about this project. So at this point, Tim has uh, is again. He has another picture with Tim working on the uh, on the ropes and getting it ready to be lowered. And now we start the process of, of lowering the tower. Of course, the other thing that made it uh, good is that we had, a, we had an able winch operator on the other end. Brian Aurora K4 UL came. And a strong hand to guide it down. Because what you, if you think about this uh, setting, they'll give you a little more detail. It's, uh, it's the tower is sort of in a, a little cutout that was in the woods. We cut had cut trees away from where the tower was, but it had begun to grow over the years. And that additional growth, by the way, gave us some, some complications later on in this process that I'll explain. So finally, we got the uh, antenna down and we we're pulling it out of this little cutout space and bringing it out um, into the um, into the field to, uh, to begin the process of taking it apart. We needed to take a look at the antenna to make sure there wasn't any damage. And then we began the process of disassembling and, and packaging it for transport. 
and we started to turn, turn our thoughts to now the tower. But even the XYL dives in, and you can see now that we've got the elements off. Uh, we still have the boom very much intact, although it, it, uh, at a certain when we got toward the end of it, we actually took the last third off so we could transport it. And then we got the brain trust to start talking about what should we do about the tower. Um, the options essentially were you could put the gen pole up there and then jack the a piece of tower up and, and then uh, lower that down and then lower the gen pole and do that again. And that was going to take a lot of time. And um, the tower was in pretty good, was in good shape. Uh, so we decided um, that uh, we were going to take a different approach to uh, to dropping to getting this tower down. So we decided to drop the pull the pins and let it fall. And that was uh, that was an interesting process. By the way, if you look at this picture carefully, what you'll see down here is uh, two pieces of trex. The what I had out here was I had a, a, a like a utility box from DX Engineering. And so what I did, what I was doing is I was bringing the rotator cables down and the coax down and had, had lightning arresters out here at the, uh, at the utility box. And so my plan was to, to do that same thing uh, over at, at the new location. So you see the tower is leaning against the trees. And part of the challenge here is that, and if you look carefully over here, there was a vine that was growing up along the guy wire. And that vine, and we had to cut back in, in, into the edges and, and really start working on this, uh, the vine, because the vine was very strong. It had been there for a while. And it was at the point where even if you got a, a, a ladder, it was hard to get up there to, to, uh, to trim that off. So I, my recommendation, if you ever have a guy tower, make sure you uh, keep the vines away from them. But eventually we uh, pulled the bottom of the tower out, again, using the winch, and got it on the, on the ground and dragged it out. And it was in good shape. Um, so we found that a horse trailer is an excellent vehicle for transporting sections of Rowan 25G. And so that tower is now over at Doug Good's house uh, in, uh, in, I guess that's Gordonsville. Yeah, it's Gordonsville. Bob, when you unbolted the tower sections, did they readily separate? Yes, it was fairly easy to get them apart. Very easy to get them apart. And I was quite surprised. And now uh, I'm doing a different kind of tower over here. We're going to talk about it in, in a few minutes. I have, have some, some questions that we need to kick around on that one. And so uh, Mike Gilmore and AJ, uh, here you got Brian here. This is I have this eight, I have probably Doug. And here's Jim Owen again. Um, so we loaded the, uh, the beam up on, on this trailer so that the beam ended up heading off to, to my house over here in Palmyra. And at the end of the day, this is what the site looked like. Um, the tower is gone, antenna's gone. So, um, so I had help from a number of people. I, this, I hope this is a complete list. Uh, I shouldn't have that piece there, but it is. Um, so Tim Jellison, John Porter, Brian O'Rourke, Jim Owen, Doug Good. Jim Wilson was the photographer on site. There was a picture, maybe I went past that one. I want to, want to make a comment about that slide. Let me get to that. So we had how a documentary. How many know. years had the tower been up? Uh, that tower was put up in the late 80s. Uh, originally it was a 38 foot tower and uh, um, WG4T and AA4KP came over and helped us put it up to 38 feet. And then later on, we added two more 10 foot sections to take it to 58 feet. So it had been up for a while. I'm gonna say at least uh, at least 35 years. Was, was there, uh, Bob, did you have any uh, 
corrosion on the tower itself? How did the galvanize hold up? And, and uh, can you talk about that a little bit? No corrosion at all. I was really, really surprised, and Tim was as well. Um, I was very pleased with the condition of, the, of that. Okay, yeah, because it looked good, and you know, in the pictures, it looked looked like you just put it up. It looked good. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a kind of amazing. Um, so Tim took pictures, and he actually he took. I'm going to see say at least 500 pictures during this this whole process, and sent them all to me. Um, but my comment here is that like uh, like um, uh, like Stan Lee and uh, Alfred Hitchcock, he occasionally likes to appear in his own work. So he actually took this picture. So. To both Bob, some of my Roan 45 tower sections that were installed in July 2014, at time of installation was over 42 years. And Tim Jellison, who also erected my tower, at first thought, there was a little bit of corrosion or rust broke through the galvanization. And he came to the conclusion it was one or two non-standard Roan bolts that were rusty. And you know the rust just kind of dripped down on the outside of the tower. So he's concluded that Roan galvanized towers with the original Roan galvanized hardware will easily last 50 to 70 years with no yeah. maintenance. Yeah, I was really pleased with that. So now we prepare to, to get things going over here at, at Nahor Manor. It, and I tell you, moving to Shack is a lot of work in normal times. It's even more work in, in COVID times. Uh, and I had to in, integrate the process of setting things up here with the fact that uh, we were moving into the house and that we had some major remodeling uh, uh, going on here at the time, so we started small. John came over and helped uh, put up a, a 210 foot G5 RV along the edge of the woods and it's doing quite nicely. Uh, I started out with, uh, with my VHF UHF antennas just strapped to the, to the deck, uh, but we eventually got them mounted to the, to the gable up on, the, on the, the peak of the roof and that's helpful. Um, We've did, now the other thing I will tell you is that because of where we decided we needed to put the tower, I decided not to get a guide tower. We wanted a, a freestanding tower, but we had to get a heavy duty one because of the because of the wind loading associated with the, with this beam. And so I have a, a fifty foot heavy duty universal tower. And it's kind of amazing because um, you know you, it, it's 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 light. The whole tower itself uh, doesn't weigh any more than 200 pounds. What brand did you get? Well, what... it, it, it's, it's the Universal Tower. You can order them from Universal Towers or through Oh, Texas that is the... Yeah, that's the brand. Um, <clears throat> and I believe Don Easton has the same make and model. His might be 60 feet. I'm not sure. Yeah. Very wide. Yep. So... So we've, we've actually got the, uh, the base installed in the concrete board and I'm gonna show you this story here. So <clears throat> this is the beam that's sitting in the garage currently. These are, this is the base. And this is actually the heaviest part of the shipment that came from Universal. Uh, and then of course, this is the, the bottom, two, bottom section. And then there are two sections in here and two sections in here. And I didn't take a picture, there's a, yeah, so there you can see the, the legs there. There's the elements from the, from the, uh, the summer's beam. Uh, these are the boom sections for the summer's beam. And uh, so over there. So you, you got the HD. Yes. I'm looking at it right now. This, these prices are pretty impressive. That's not that bad. Yep. The, uh, the, the challenge was the shipping. And what made the shipping more expensive was I got a 16 foot mast. Yeah, this, this meeting might have cost me some money right here. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, a new day dawns. <laughs> we, get, uh, we get the, um, the guy with the, with the uh, backhoe to show up. There's the place where we decided we were, wanted the hole delivered. And so the dig began. <laughs> 
the specification said that what we what we needed was a hole that was five feet by five feet by six feet. Um, and uh, but because we used the kind of equipment that we did, it ended up being five feet by seven feet by six feet. We didn't hit shale. We didn't hit shale until we got to about the four foot level. Um, yeah. And then, of course, the the process is that you cut the base of the tower and you level it and you secure it, and then check the level again uh, because you need to do all of that uh, to, uh, to for the concrete pour. And we thought. Once we got that done, well, gosh, we're going to have the, the concrete delivered this afternoon and we'll be good to go. Well, it turns out we waited. Turns out we had to wait 10 days for the concrete truck people to show up. Bob, is the tower serve as the rebar or is your rebar in there? I don't remember what we did at Don's. Um, there's a little bit of rebar down there, but not much. Um, and um, really, they don't, they don't, they don't, in their instructions, recommend that you use rebar. We just felt we needed to do a little bit at, at, down at the base to keep things exactly where they wanted them to be. That's part of what we did there. So the truck showed up and the concrete got poured and, and, uh, then we got working on making it look good. So the next steps are to assemble the tower, erect the tower, uh, get the antennas put together. Uh, because I'm using this utility box, I've got to do uh, cable runs from the from the shack to the utility bus and the, or the utility box and cable runs for the antennas and the rotator uh, down to the uh, to the to the box. Mount up the antennas, the rotator, and get on the air. Um, the if you there's some videos out there, and I've they rec they basically recommend just assemble it on the ground and then just push it up. Um, I'm not sure I'm we're going to be able to do that with with what uh, I have planned because with the 16 foot mast and there's a VHF antenna I want to put at the very top. Um, that's going to be a fairly long item. It's going to be, you know, 50 feet plus another 11 or 10, um, well, because of the mast. So we'll have to see how that all goes. But that's, um, anyway. Uh, so we thought we were ready to, to get going. And, and then Mother Nature threw us a curve. Bob, the tower base hinges away from the house. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. So if you look at it this way, you, you pop this back one and it comes away from the house. Okay, that's right. Now I remember from Don's. So you're, you're saying if you do need a professional tower installer, it's going to be strictly to install the beam and the mat, because you would raise yeah. it with the mast installed. Yes, exactly. So, so the, the whole idea is is to maximize his time by doing the antennas, the rotator, and, and not have him, him build it section by section on the top. Just, I don't, want to, I don't want to spend a lot of money doing that when it seems reasonable that we can assemble it on the ground. And Tim seems to think that, that that's, a, that's a decent approach. So it's, it's, at this point, it's a matter of, um, well, several things. I've, st I've still got to get the, the, the cables done. Um, and um, I've got to make sure I have all the parts I need for all the things that I want to do before I say, Jim, come on down. The precondition he has set is that, is that he's got to have a clear road between Elkins, West Virginia and, and where I am. And so that's Route 33. It was kind of funny because when he was going to the place at, at my old house up in Rutgersville, it's like he came out his driveway, got on 33, took 33 all the way into uh, into uh, um, Rutgersville, made made two turns, and he was at my house. So it's pretty strange. Bob, what's your estimated time to reassemble the summer's beam? Well. I've put three of these together um, over the years. 
I, I think we can uh, probably do it in about four or five hours. Do you have to replace any of the stainless steel hardware? I don't think so. All of it was in good shape. If you uh, do though, we, you know, Martin's hardware is the best place to buy stainless steel hardware. That's, a, that's good to know. Um, so are there any other questions that anybody has about the, uh, and let me just simply say that, that um, we'll let everybody know when we're getting ready to do these things. Uh, we're gonna need help. And, but some of you may wanna just stop by and see what's going on. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping to have this, uh, this thing up by mid-February. My um, schedule has been impacted a little bit by something that we did not anticipate. Um, last week, Anne fell in the garage. She missed the last step and broke three bones in her pelvis. So she's home here and I'm her primary caregiver. Uh, and we have plans to take a transcontinental train trip beginning on the 3rd of March. So we're working through, you know, physical therapy and all kinds of stuff to get that done too. Uh, but I've got to tell you that I'm really grateful. She's been very supportive of what I'm doing in ham radio and eager to get this, this station back on the air fully functional and beyond where it was before. So I've got a good life partner in, in that. And I'm, so I'm very grateful for that. So with that, we each, take, each day is a new day and a new challenge. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Um, I was going to so the the um, VHF UHF uh, antenna that's going to go at the top up where those support ropes were. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to put a you know, create log periodic up there that does everything between six meters and one point two gigahertz. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Figured it was worth doing that because I now have the ICOM ninety seven hundred which does. 1.2, 440, and, and two meters. Bob, where will the rotator be mounted reference the top plate of the tower? I think the rotator is gonna be down about six or seven feet from the, from the top of the tower because we've got, uh, I've got the uh, thrust bearing stuff I've got to put on there too. But the Yagi itself will only be, I assume, the way you had me do mine, maybe a foot yeah. and a half. Yeah, no, 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 no further than that. Because the other part of it is you've got somebody's got to be up fairly close to the very top of the tower to be able to get that boom support piece up that goes yeah. out with the rope and, and pulls that up. So you mount that fairly close to the very top. Or to the I was going to mount mine originally six feet above the top plate. And I don't remember if it was you or Tim Jellison said, nope. Yeah. <laughs> because you need to get access to the ballon and the feed point, which are caused 90% of the maintenance issues. Yeah, and the, I think if you notice the, uh, let me go back to this slide, that, that presents a real challenge for me because I have a, I have a trade-off that I've got to, to do. Um, the, uh, the ballon on this antenna, let's see if I can share this screen again back up here. But can you see that? Did I share yet? No. Not yet. Share a screen. But so, if you need to replace your ballon, talk to me offline. Yeah, the problem is the ballon is, is way out in the front on that 10 foot boom. And so uh, you, can't, you can't move the ballon back because of the way it attaches to the um, the, to all those driven elements that we use. It's kind of like a, uh, yeah, uh, it's part of a metal network that uh, attaches everything to, to one place. So let me go and see. So here, this is sort of like the front end of the antenna and there's oh. the ballon right there. And that's, and that's, I can go to this screen. That's right out here. 
So if this is a 20 foot boom, that's really out there probably at about 17 feet. Well, so you can't okay. reach it. You can't reach it. So that's, but that's one of the reasons that we had the work done in 2017, because I had concluded that the ballon was failing or there was a problem with the feed line out there. So I replaced the feed line, replaced the ballon. That's a, that's a, a Jerry Sevick ballon right there. So. See, in my Yagi, the ballon was right a foot behind the mast. I was able, I could, I replaced it myself once. All right, any, any other questions? All right, well then I'll turn it back to, to your regular scheduled program. Bob, I thought that was an excellent